I'm Megan Gebhardt. I'm based in our Chicago office. I work with our North American distributors, and many of you have joined us, so thank you very much for doing so. Tom is a veterinarian who is on our UK tech team, and he's worked very closely with the research and testing that has gone into producing this oxygen barrier bail wrap film. We're very excited about the product, but we know that there are a lot of questions because it's brand new to the market and brand new to really most of you. Many of you have had people ask you for bail wrap in the past, um, and now we can say we have it. So, Tom, please take it away for us. Okay. Thank you very much, Megan. <clears throat> and my apologies to everyone uh, for our technical problems. Uh, I'm now on a phone line. I hope you can all hear me and you can see the presentation on your computers. All right. As Megan uh, has introduced me, uh, my name is Dr. Tom Chamberlain. I'm a member of the Silasop technical support team. What I want to do in the next 40 or 50 minutes is to provide you with some technical knowledge and some information uh, that will give you a better background about barrel wrapping, about our product, uh, things that happen in the field, problems that can occur, all in the aim to support you when you're working with your, your clients and your customers out in the field. Uh, thank you all very much for joining me this morning. I appreciate you've all got a busy day ahead of you. Uh, so I would hope we're going to finish on time despite our hiccups. Okay, what I want to cover in this topic <clears throat> is firstly just a general introduction to baleage and to bale wrap, and then we'll move on from there to look at some of the specific properties uh, and qualities of the Silastop bale wrap film. We'll also look at the basics of bale wrap machines, how they work, how they wrap, um, because it's quite likely that you may get the odd question thrown at you uh, that these bales aren't getting wrapped correctly, what's happening? Um, and it's useful to be able to start investigating the problems. So we'll then finish off with some tips on how to produce well wrapped bales. Okay, so what is baleage and what is bale wrapping? Okay, forage, most typical and most common shape is that the bales are wrapped into a cylinder that's four or five foot long and about four foot uh, in diameter. As with all silage making, we're interested action when we conserve the forage and so the bales are wrapped fairly tight or baled fairly tight to remove as much air as possible. All the pre films on the market are pre-stretched before they're put on the bale, a little bit like an elastic band, and so they're under tension when they're on the bale and that pushes out more of them. The films are all very thin, they're only about one mil thick. Uh, they are, when they're stretched they get a little bit thinner and so if we're looking at four to eight layers, then we're talking about three to six mil of plastic covering the bale. And we need to bear in mind that's a pretty thin layer of plastic that's easily damaged. What we want the plastic to do, like any plastic with silage, is to keep oxygen out because we want anaerobic conditions within the bale to get in siling rather than rotting. And we want to maintain that seal uh, as we store the bale over the months um, and possibly even years. But the general principles of making baleage are the same as making silage in bunks, uh, in towers, in piles and so forth. So much of the knowledge that you already have about bunk silos, you can apply to baleage. Okay, so what can we bale? Seen just about everything baled. Um, the one that's not baled that often at the moment is corn silage. Um, but that is coming soon, and we may see uh, corn silage being baled for the next five or ten years. Okay, <clears throat> when you're baling uh, in baleage, you do want your fodder to be slightly drier than you would use in a bunker. 45 to 50 percent is our target. If material is baled too wet, then the bales don't hold their shape over time, and they tend to slump. And we'll see some pictures later. And there's a large risk the layers of plastic over the bale will slump and will open up. Okay, Just as common probably is baling too dry. <clears throat> um, if you're baling too dry, you've got low levels of available water. You may have low levels of microbial substrates, uh, the sugars, so you're going to get restricted fermentation. You won't get such a, a great fall in pH, 
Um, and so therefore, you've got an increased risk of moles growing and other problems such as listeria. Okay, <clears throat> just to go back a step or two and look at the history of Bainbridge. <coughs> Pardon me. It all started in the 1970s uh, in the north of England, in the UK, and in Australia. The very initial work was done with machines that were designed for baling straw uh, after composting cereal crops. They weren't really the right machines for the jobs. Wet forage caused problems, and there were issues. The very initial work in the 1970s and 80s, uh, bales were put in individual plastic bags. Uh, and then were sealed by hand uh, with a cable tie or some such thing. Okay, that was pretty laborious. It used a lot of plastic. That's now been abandoned, and just about all bales now are wrapped uh, in some stretch film shown in that second picture. It's worth bearing in mind that the technology of wrapping and baling is fairly mature, um, and in that process, it's become fairly automated, uh, and such that a lot of the operators have lost contact with what they're doing. They tend just to know, well, if I press this button, this is what happens, rather than knowing exactly how many layers they're putting on, what overlap they're doing, and so forth. Okay. All the films that are available and that we use are much the same. They're one mil thick, 5,000 foot long, 29 inches wide. Some of the original machines used a 20 inch wide uh, roll of film. Don't think many of those are made anymore, but you may see them occasionally in the niche markets uh, for small rumors and so forth. Okay, the films are designed to be stretchy, and we'll come on to that, and they're tacky on one side. It does take the tack a little while to mature and to work its way through the film after manufacture, and so you do need to make sure that uh, rolls of film are at least one month old before you use them, uh, and the, bail, the rolls will be stamped with their date. Of manufacture. Okay, all of these films are polyethylene based. They are co-extruded in that you've got several different layers of plastic and tachyfiers and resins in there. Um, and the main process of producing them is they are blown like a giant sausage skin and then processed from there onwards. Okay, just want the next few slides to look at some of the current developments uh, you will see out there uh, in the field. The original work. Um, and the original, most of the original machines worked with round bales because they're easier to bale. However, round bales aren't so easy to store, they aren't so easy to transport. So there is interest in square bales, uh, and you will see square bales out there. Both types of bales can be wrapped. The only problem, or the issue to bear in mind, is that the square bales, the degree of stretch and the tension on the corners of the bales is very high. And this can be the area where you get damage or where you get stalks poking through. So they do need to be done a little more care. Okay, <clears throat> the next development you'll find probably on most balers now is that they are fitted with chopping knives that are on the pickup reel. Okay, and these will chop the forage down to a few inches long. The advantages are you're going to get better compaction, so you're going to have less residual air in the bale. Going to get heavier bales, so there's less numbers of bales to be moved per ton. The other attraction is that pre chopped bales are much easier to incorporate into uh, a TMR, a total mixed ration uh, for uh, animals. A lot of mixer wagons will struggle to chop up the long fibre in an unchopped bale, see what I mean, uh, and then you can get sorting uh, at the feed face. So uh, chopping is, is widely used and is probably to be preferred. Another development uh, which is fairly common is to increase the number of what are called the pre stretchy uh, These are the units, uh, here you can see two of them here, that apply the film to the bale. Uh, the very first ones and some of the simple ones on the market now have one pre stretch unit. This machine has two. Uh, other machines in line wrappers may have up to four. The advantage of this is that it's the wrapping on many systems that is the rate limiting step, and so these machines are going to be faster. Uh, this development, I've seen a lot of it in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and so forth, uh, are inline wrappers. Okay, they are faster, 
generally on this uh, situation, the rate limiting step is the speed at which they can load bales onto the platform. They're going to use less plastic because they don't have to wrap uh, the ends of every single bale. Uh, looking at it from an English viewpoint, we wouldn't have the space for storage. Um, and you can see in that lower picture these great long lines of bales laid out across the field. But it is worth bearing in mind that you want to be able to have access to that field all the way through the winter, whatever the weather is, without the ground poaching up and becoming muddy. Okay, one of the more recent developments is in the name of speeding things up and reducing the amount of tactile power needed is to combine the baler and the wrapper. The initial machines shown here on the left, you've got a baler here at the front and then fixed onto the back, you've got a separate wrapping platform. A newer machine here from McHale, one of the leading manufacturers, they incorporated the two into one body so we've got the baler at the front here and the wrapper there. However, even a machine like this is fairly stop-start because every time a bale is transferred from the baling uh, chamber to the wrapping platform, the tractor has to stop whilst that baling takes place. Uh, the latest development in balers coming through now is to have a continuous process so the tractor can drive continuously, picking up forage all the time, um, and there's a method of holding a bale, or holding rapidly a uh, baling component whilst the bales are transferred across. Okay. <clears throat> the last development, and this is only just coming on the market, um, and it's probably still largely a prototype, um, this again is a McHale, is that they are now using film to wrap the bales rather than netting or string. String is used in very early stages, the most common form now is netting. Uh, two advantages of this. One is you get better compaction because the bale it doesn't expand uh, to go into the tension of the, the netting, so you get less air in the bale. Uh, and the other attraction, um, which farmers, large scale farmers, will find very useful, is it's easier to remove uh, film than, rather than netting a feed out. Um, if you watch someone doing it, uh, on farm, every bale they have to get out of the tractor, out of the handler, unwrap the bale with a knife, throw away the plastic, and then uh, start feeding that bale. And in cold weather, as you're going to get in the central states of America, that netting can be frozen into the signage bale in winter. Uh, so it gets a very tedious and unpleasant job to remove the netting. This brings us on to the last development, uh, and the one that we're proud of we want to talk about, which is the development of our uh, silo stock bale wrap film. And this is the first time an oxygen barrier technology has been built into bale wrap. We launched it uh, last fall, um, so it's early days and we're still building up experience. Everything that you know about the technology and the science of the orange bunker films uh, applies to um, the bale wrap film. Okay, and it's the industry leader and it's actually the first um, bale wrap that can claim low oxygen transmission rates. The other property that it's got due to its chemical makeup is it's slightly more elastic than conventional films, as you will see. So this is the technical data uh, for bale wrap here in the orange uh, row. And below here, we've got a leading product in Europe and a leading product uh, in the States. Okay, you can see they're all about one mil thick before they're stretched. When they're stretched to 70 mil stretch, which is the conventional normal stretch for round bales, the polyethylene ones thin down quite considerably. Silastop retains more of its initial thickness. If you're putting four, five, six layers of wrap on a bale, you're effectively gaining an extra layer of wrap. So there is slightly more plastic there to protect it. Pre-stretch, the oxygen transmission rates, uh, you've got about a hundred-fold difference here, very similar to we see with bunker films. Once the films are stretched, the oxygen transmission rates change, but as, again, we've still got a considerable difference there. Um, the silostop, even after stretching, is about 30 40 to 40 times more effective as an oxygen barrier uh, than the 
polyethylene plastics. And this work was done in Germany uh, in a laboratory that specializes in applying standard techniques. Okay, just some thoughts about bale shape and how this compares to a silo. In a silo, we're often concerned about what's happening in the outer two foot of the bale, sorry, two foot of, of the bunk. When you do the math on a, a bale of signage, a quarter of the volume or the mass of that signage is in the outer two and a quarter inches, and half of it, half of the volume of the signage is in the outer five inches. So half of the signage is within five inches of the ramp. And so any oxygen permeating through uh, and causing aerobic conditions and aerobic spoilage uh, just under the plastic has got the potential to affect a large amount of the bale, a large volume of the signage. So why do we want an oxygen barrier? What are the benefits? We're going to get an initial Fermentation is going to be better. We're going to get a faster fall in pH uh, down to a stable pH because we've got less oxygen coming through the plastic. We get those benefits again during storage, uh, and particularly if you're storing for six months or more, that we'll get a considerable re reduction in aerobic spoilage, uh, and spores, and mold growth from the plastic. Uh, and data we have from trials shows, and in our literature shows, that we reduce the dry matter losses by 40% per bale. Uh, this is made up from uh, figures from conventional polyethylene wrapped bales, where the workers recorded a 7.7% loss in dry matter. Bales wrapped in Cytostop, and within the same trial, uh, the dry matter losses had fallen to 4.6%. The other thing we're observing, and we're getting reports back from the field as more and more farmers are using this product, is that they're getting a much better product at the end. They like the look of the bale, they smell better, there's less visible damage, uh, and they feel they feed better to the animals. Right. I just want to spend a few minutes going through this table. It's in our sales literature, uh, and it's been the source of many questions. Um, this is trying to put some financial figures onto the costs and benefits of using different bale wraps. And I just want to concentrate on the top two rows. So if we look at that first row here, what we're doing is making a comparison between a control really here of a bale wrap in six layers of polyethylene, which is an industry standard used on many, many farms, and then we're comparing it to using silo stock either four layers here or in combination down there. Okay, column A here is the cost of plastic of the product that's being used. Silostop uh, is more expensive than polyethylene, so even when you go from six layers down to four layers, you actually incur an extra cost of 90 cents. However, on many systems, putting fewer layers onto a bale allows the custom worker to go faster. Uh, if that is the rate limiting step. And so if they can go faster, they can bail more bales in a day, and so the labor is going to drop by 71 cents. So on this first scenario here, the net effect to the custom worker is it's going to cost 19 cents more um, to make bales covered in bale wrap. We get this reduction, uh, or this reduction in dry matter losses, so we end up with an extra 3.5% more dry matter in a bale wrapped with Cytostop than in a bale wrapped with polyethylene. <clears throat> and using standard figures, that's worth about $1.26. So the net effect at the end, um, when that bale has been made and has been fed out to uh, animals to stock, is a gain of $1.07. On machines with more than one um, dispenser, more than one free stretch unit, uh, we can cut down the amount of silo stock down to two layers because we know that we only require two layers of silo stock to get the oxygen barrier. When we do that, the, uh, there is a slight uh, gain on these figures. It's actually eight cents cheaper in terms of plastic. We still get the gain in the uh, customer worker can work faster, so the custom worker actually ends up 
79 cents better off. Uh, we don't get quite a good, or the trial work didn't show quite such a good dry matter saving, so it's only 2%, so we have 72 cents more feed per bale that we give the animals, and so the net gain uh, is $1.51. And we can extend those arguments to all sorts of different combinations of bale. Okay, what I want to do in the next few slides is go through some of the components of a bale mapper. Okay, and if we start with this picture, most machines, or just about all machines I've seen, will have some means of storing rolls so that the custom workers can go out into the field with enough rolls uh, attached to the machine that they can run all day. The reason for flagging this up is that you do have to be slightly careful how you store a uh, bale map. Uh, if you're keeping it in very hot conditions in full sun on a hot summer's day, uh, you can get damage to the bale, to, sorry, to the roll of film, and you can get something called telescoping. The biggest component of uh, all these wrappers is a wrapping table here. Uh, this has got the ability to roll the bale around. These black belts uh, move and the bear will roll uh, in horizontal, along its horizontal axis. And then on a simple system, you've got some means of loading the bear onto the table. <coughs> okay, this machine has got two pre-stretch units, uh, these uh, units here and here, and on this machine, they go around on an orbital arm. Some of the older machines, it was the table that revolved on a vertical axis. Okay, we've got, you can just about see there are some alignment bobbins to keep the bale uh, correctly positioned on the table. And then the last component of significance are the yellow units here and here, which cut the film when you get to the end of the bale. Okay, what I want to do now is just uh, talk a little bit about these units uh, highlighted here, the pre stretch units, because they're a common area the problems and poor maintenance. And if you're observing problems with wrapping on farm, that's probably your first port of call to investigate and to see what's going on. Okay, pre-stretch units are fairly simple. They're designed to stretch the film by a specific amount before it's applied to the bale. And then that gives it some elasticity uh, to hold the wrap on the bale and to compress the bale. Okay, there are gears up here uh, in this black uh, cover, under this black cover here. This uh, one here, this roller here is driven, and then with the gears up in the headstock here, this one will run 70% faster. Okay, they do need cleaning frequently, and you can see this is a custom worker uh, with a small scale unit. He's got a build up of tack, of tachyphonos on here. Uh, and this really should be removed on a regular basis to allow the plastics to run freely. <coughs> okay, it's worth just checking how people have loaded uh, the film onto the pre-stretch unit. Uh, if you're not concentrating, it is possible to do it wrong. You'll see two techniques out there. One where it goes around two uh, rollers, but ro both rollers are free. Roller one is the brake roller, that's the one that picks up the drive, and then that propels roller two, which spins faster and stretches the film. Okay, on this system, the brake roller is driven by being in contact with the roller film. Whichever system you see, you should see on just about every single uh, machine you look at, somewhere there'll be a decal around to show users how to load that film and to get it right but worth being the first point of call to check. Okay, so how are pails wrapped? Okay. Um, this is a bale wrapper set up uh, and ready to receive a bale. When you wrap the very first bale of the day, you have to fix a film to something on the feed table, uh, so on the bale table, so that it uh, can wrap. Okay, when you wrap sub subsequent bales, the film will be held here in the cutters. Okay, this is a bale being loaded on. 
uh, this is actually a bale of hay that we're using for demonstration. It will be picked up by the um, loader mechanism and put onto the table. So it's lifted up, placed on the table, and then the wrapping procedure starts. Uh, the bale will be re revolving around its horizontal axis. It's been driven by the table here. And these two pre-stretch units will be orbiting around the bale on this silver mechanism here to cover the bale. And so a given number of layers will be applied, I'll come on to that in a minute, um, to cover the bale. And then that bale is then dropped off. Just a word of caution, uh, if you're working around uh, bale wrappers, this bale probably weighs a thousand pounds, and you can see it's rolled uh, 15, 20 foot away from the wrapper. Um, you know, make sure that no one is stood in its way uh, because you will get flattened. Okay, what can we look at? What are common things to check uh, when there are problems with bale wrapping? One well, of the first things to check is that the bale wrap is lined up correctly with the bale. Okay, so film alignment is such that the middle or center line of the film here is in line with the center line of the bale. It doesn't want to be too high or too low, you're going to start to get distortions. Okay, also have a good look at the shape of the bale. Um, and that will be partially dependent on the shape of the forage swap. If it's just rolled up into one single row, then you end up with a barrel shape. Uh, quite common, but not quite so good to bail. Okay, you can row up to give uh, two uh, peaks uh, in the swap, and that will help give you a more cylindrical uh, shape. And if you watch a skilled baler uh, uh, running, at, driving a baler, they will actually be moving the pickup reel across the swap as they're going across the field, trying to get an evenly shaped cylindrical bale. If it's been rowed up poorly, uh, the headland edges of the fields and so forth, then you might start getting cone-shaped bales. If you've got poor-shaped bales, they're going to be more difficult to wrap. Okay. You want to try and have a way of checking uh, the degree of stretch uh, on the bale. And most machines uh, and all the films we've looked at uh, are designed for 70% stretch on round bales. And that might come down to 55% stretch on square bales and in some weather conditions. The way to check that is just to draw two lines or make a mark on the roll that is four inches apart run the film through the baler enough uh, so that you can get those lines onto the bale, measure it again, and you should be six and three quarters inches. And here's an example uh, that we did um, using in, uh, imperial metric units. So four inches between those two markers there, or 10 centimeters, that was run through um, onto the bale, and here it is on the bale, and that is now 17.5 centimeters or six and three quarter inches. That's 75% uh, stretch, and that's within uh, the tolerances. That's what we want. Okay. As the film stretches, it will also neck down. Uh, so it's worth measuring the width of the film on the bale, and our target there is somewhere between 23. 24 inches. All balers that I've met, certainly mono balers, are wrapping one bale at a time, are designed to have a 50% overlap. So when the whole bale is covered, uh, there will be two layers of film uh, on that bale, on all of the surface of the bale. The overlap should be even, so that the degree of overlap should be about 12 inches uh, on all bales, on all wraps. Have a look to see how the rolls of film have been stored and have been handled. Um, our product is sent out on a, a plastic core uh, because that's not affected by rain and wet and mud and so forth. It's not going to soften. And the core, the central core, should project by half an inch um, above the 
main body of the film to protect it. If this edge gets too badly damaged due to poor handling, then uh, the film is going to struggle to come off the roll and you can get breakages just as you would with a real acetate. Okay, <clears throat> a word or two about vermin. Um, every country who wraps bales or makes signage has problems with vermin. Uh, it depends which state, which country you're from, as to which is your biggest problem. Uh, we certainly have problems with rats um, and badgers, and I think probably birds as worldwide. Uh, raccoons and pigs are, are common in America. Okay, you can see here uh, these are some rats who've got into a, a pile of uh, bales, uh, droppings here, and you can see they've made small holes in the plastic, just nibbling through each of which is going to let air through, we're going to get aerobic spoilage. Uh, this client has, has baited the traps, has baited the, um, the stack of bales, but you're going to have to be careful recovering that, that it doesn't get uh, into the fed to other animals, pets, and so forth. Other things to do to control vermin is good fencing around your, uh, your pile of bales. And that's probably going to have to go alongside having a mown area so that there's no cover to allow vermin to get there. Where birds are a problem, then you're going to have to use, think, think about using raised nets uh, so that the birds can't actually land on the bales themselves and start causing problems. Handling. Handling should always be done with a, a dedicated specialist handler. Uh, and you can see these two here. They've got wide um, arms or metalwork within the arms so that they're not going to start breaking the plastic. Many, many farms will have spikes for handling straw bales or for helping with feeding out. These shouldn't be used when handling the bales because you've then got to go around and patch up all the holes, uh, which can be an incomplete job. Okay. When handling the bales, Really, you're trying to handle the wrapped bales as little as possible. And many of the textbooks will say that bales should actually be wrapped uh, in the yard back at the farm rather than in the field. Okay. Um, if they are wrapped in the field, then really they should be removed immediately or certainly within a week when the initial fermentation has taken place and not left in the field for months and months, exposed to the vermin in the weather. Uh, as you can see, is hand in this picture. It's worth bearing in mind that if you've only wrapped with four layers of um, wrap on a bale, you've got a very thin three uh, mil layer of plastic on there. And those bales do require careful handling. Many workers and many uh, field operatives have gone to six layers of film. Uh, and this does give a, a tougher bale, which is easier to handle. If you drop back to four layers, there will be a certain amount of relearning required whilst they learn how to be to handle the bales delicately and not break the film. How should bales be stacked? Ideally, they should be stacked on end. Um, if you think about it and you look at a bale, there's considerably more plastic on the top and the bottom of the bale than there is on the circumference. So they should be stacked uh, two, three, maybe four layers high to dry sizes like that. Unfortunately, more commonly, bales are stacked on their sides. It doesn't look quite such a stable stack, so there are issues in terms of safety there. But it does mean the bales don't need to be turned at any stage. Um, they're in the same orientation as they came out of the baler. Okay, um, but we've got less practice plastic to protect the bale. And you can see here, these bales, are, they were made in England for dairy cows. They were cut fairly early in the season. The dry matter was not that high, and they've started slumping. Their shape's been distorted considerably, and there is a risk possibly there, and possibly here, that the layers of wrap are starting to split and separate apart, and air can get in. Okay, just a, a word or two about inline wrappers. I appreciate they're very common uh, in uh, central states. Okay, how many layers they apply is related to the overlap that you see. Uh, and if we look in this bottom picture, uh, we were mixing polyethylene uh, with silostock bale wrap, so it's very easy to visualise uh, the 
is the overlap. And on this one, the overlap is 20 centimeters, uh, which is eight inches. So with eight inches, um, sorry, eight inches would give us three layers. Three inches would give us eight layers, and so forth. Okay, this machine, uh, these bales here were wrapped by this machine here, and slightly complicated, this machine has actually got the ability to hold two rolls in each satellite. So it's putting on two layers of plastic each time it goes around the bale. Okay, so although this looks like there's only three layers of plastic here, there's actually six layers of plastic. Most bales, uh, inline wrappers, will also be set up to actually pour slightly when it gets to the junction between different bales and put on two extra layers of plastic. As you can see in this picture, this is the biggest area of weakness and that's where more plastic is needed. Okay. Just a word or two about how you determine uh, the number of layers of film on a bale. Uh, and in, in brief, it's not that easy. You can tease them apart here, apart with a knife, but my personal experience is it's quite difficult to be satisfied that you've got a single layer of plastic in each layer there. Um, here we've got five layers of plastic. Uh, if you're going to do this, I would do it away from the client in the first instance. Practice a little bit. Okay, just to finish then, uh, to summarize, Siling um, uh, baleage is very similar to uh, the processes that are used in bunkers. So a lot of the knowledge that you have from bunkers will apply to making silage as baleage. Okay. The technology for baling and for wrapping is, is fairly mature now. Um, and so most machines should work correctly if set up correctly. Okay. The oxygen barrier technology is probably more important in a bale than it is in a bunker because so much of the material is within a few inches of the wrap surface, um, which isn't the case in a bunker. Okay, and then lastly, we've looked at a range of simple tests there that you can use to check if bale wrappers are working correctly. Uh, and that brings me to the end of the presentation. So if there are any questions that Megan has, uh, has collected together, uh, we can address those now, or more questions can come through. Thank you very much, Tom. I have distributed a handout. You should be able to see it. It is the bail wrap Q&A final version. That is commonly asked questions and answers about our bail wrap product. If anyone has questions for Tom now, you can type them in, and I can pass them along to him and get those answered. You also will be able to watch this recorded webinar on our website and on YouTube, and I will distribute the address of those pages to everyone um, after the program and once this is posted. And if you do have further questions, you can always email me, Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, at silostop.com, or you can email Tom, at silostop.com as well. Um, we really hope that you had some good information here. Thanks for sticking with us through the beginning. And um, I don't have any questions showing up here, Tom, so if I receive more, I will definitely okay. pass those along. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, and uh, looks like we've caught up on time a little bit. So I wish you well over the rest of the day. Thank you. Tom, I do have one question about UV protection. Uh, what sort of protection yeah. does this provide? Yeah. UV protection is going to be between 12 and 18 months, uh, depending on your level of, um, of sunshine. So northern states, 18 months. Uh, as you get further south, 12 months. Um, I think most people who I've worked with would try and use bales within a year of making anyway. Um, they just feed better. Uh, you've got less chance of vermin attack and so forth. To take them through two winters, uh, you can end up with a lot of vermin damage. Thank you. 
if anyone else has any questions, I don't see any coming up here, but you can certainly respond to us later as well. Again, Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N at silostop.com or Tom at silostop.com as well will work. And we will distribute the final Q&A as well as the recorded webinar um, to everyone later. Thanks very much, everyone.